Hello. My name is Daniel Sellers, and I'm delighted to be presenting this, the first in a series of videos produced by NALA on the theme of adult numeracy. It was my privilege over the past two years to be part of a project team working with NALA on the subject of adult numeracy, looking in detail at practice in Ireland. You may well have seen these two reports. The first report that was published was published at the end of 2013, following a period of research into the practice, the teaching practice of five tutors of adult numeracy around the country. The report, What Really Counts? Case Studies of Adult Numeracy Practice in Ireland, was very well received. Tutors wanted to be able to emulate and try out many of the strategies, the teaching strategies and, and the teaching resources that were featured in those case studies. NALA invited a group of tutors together to take part in an action learning project. This project took place during the early summer of 2014 and culminated in the publication of a follow-up report, the green one, what really counts next? Action learning project with numeracy tutors. That project was a way to work with tutors, and we worked with 13 tutors from around the country who worked in different organizations to spend time getting to know the five case studies, really thinking about what practice in them they would like to use with their learners. What were the areas of practice that they didn't feel too confident in themselves? Or, or, or what topics did their learners struggle with that they wanted to be able to try new methods with and try new resources. It was a fascinating process and the project reported at the June Numeracy Conference in Dublin in 2014. Both of these reports are available online and there are several hard copies around the country. So if you haven't seen them, speak to your manager or resource worker and try and get your hands on them. I'm going to talk to you about two of the topics that came up repeatedly during the second project. As I say, tutors had a free hand to, to go through the original case studies and choose topics. And there were certain themes that came up again and again, such as the use of digital technology, the use of smartphones and iPads, how to teach measuring and also algebra. And what I'm going to focus on in this first video are the two topics of measuring and algebra. I'm going to talk to you about how tutors looked at these topics, what sort of things they did with their learners, what sort of things happened, what they would do differently, so that you get a flavour of the practice that's contained in the case studies. And you can... So I'm going to start off talking about measuring. And I'll tell you about one tutor called Mary. Mary works in Dublin as a volunteer and she teaches one-to-one. -one. Her learner works on his literacy. He also works on computers and on his numeracy during his session, his weekly session with Mary. He wasn't very confident about using rulers or tape measures and he was minded to refit his kitchen. He was going to renovate his kitchen, fit a new one, and that would involve choosing and buying new units, new equipment, new white goods, such as fridges and cookers, that kind of thing. So Mary and the learner started off by looking at how you measure a line or how you draw a line accurately using a ruler. And Mary sat with her learner and they each had a ruler and paper and Mary demonstrated how she, how she would draw a line accurately and check it. And the learner was able to mirror what she was doing. They also had um, shapes that they would measure and Mary would measure a shape and the learner would do the same. And so Mary was able to see um, to what extent her learner was understanding and able to, able to follow what she was doing. They then looked at a website, which you can also download as an app. And this is a new website called Maths Everywhere. And here's a screenshot from it. This is from the website rather than the app. 
the URL is www.mathseverywhere.org.uk and you'll see in the, the, the tab in the middle on length and distance is the one that Mary chose with her learner. And I'll just show you an example of an activity that's on that website. You can see here, this is from measuring length and distance. Which of these is a sensible estimate for the length of a car? There's a calculator there if you need it. You might not need it for this activity. Um, it, it can pop up or you can make it disappear. And Mary said that these kind of activities were particularly useful for her learner who was trying to get his head around the metric system and wasn't used to thinking in terms of meters, for example. There's a, a, a video on this website which shows you that the average door in a home or an office is two meters high. So two meters being a door was something that the learner was able to get into his head. Once he was more comfortable with the actual practice of drawing lines and measuring lines and with working with meters, millimeters and centimeters, um, Mary and the learner looked for kitchen design websites. IKEA has a great design section where you can actually plot out um, a kitchen or a room of your choice. That's not the one that they used. You can read the one that they used in the case study it, it, itself. But they were able to plan the learner's kitchen and he was able to feel confident and, and com you know, ready, ready to go out there and choose his kitchen and, and get it fitted and measured properly. Another tutor was working with a group rather than one-to-one -one, and she wanted to reinforce the concept of measuring circumference with her learners. They'd already looked at measuring the circumference using pi, but Angela had read in the original case studies about an approach that a tutor had used where he got his learners to go out into a car park and measure the circumference of car tires. Um, they already had the radiuses of the various car tires and had calculated the circumferences using pi. But Angela gave her learners the choice of measuring tools to use. And she gave them a measuring tape which had centimeters and millimeters on it. She also gave them a measuring tape that you can get from chemists or pharmacies for measuring your waste. And these are a little old fashioned because they only have inches on them. And the other tool was a piece of string. And the learners were able to go out and measure around the tires, um, mark off the measuring tape in whatever way that they wanted, and then come back into the classroom and, and compare the measurement of the circumference that they had worked out using pi with the ones that they had done with the practical activity. Angela had been quite worried about giving the learners a tape with just inches on, but in fact, it started a very useful discussion with the learners about what you might do when you have tools that are measuring in one unit and not the unit that's, that you're buying furniture in or, or whatever it is. So she, she thought that that was quite interesting. Another activity that she, that Angela led with her learners was on scale using graph paper. And she asked her learners to plot out a, to design a living room with furniture in it. But she didn't give them the scale to use. She said to them, work out how you're going to represent this using scale. Um, what does one centimeter on that graph paper equal? And at first, some of the learners were saying, well, maybe one centimeter could equal three meters. Um, so she said, well, go ahead and design it. And they soon realized that that was, that they, <laughs> their room that they were designing was absolutely tiny. So the learners between them in, 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 in their group identified that actually mo the most practical thing for the size of the room and the size of the graph paper that they had was to say that one centimeter was equivalent to 0.25 meters or 25 centimeters. And this activity where they were exploring and problem solving, Angela found to be really useful for, for really underpinning and making, making secure that concept of scale in her learners' minds. There's lots and lots in these case studies which you can read about measuring. As an example, there's, there's a great example of a tutor who works with her learners um, using graph paper and circles so that the learners could start to see where the number 3.14, etc., had come from, why we use that number, what, what is this number pi, 
and why is it so helpful to us when we're measuring circles? So you can have a read of that. And there's another great example of a couple of tutors who worked together on this project who decided to start taking photographs of their learners with the learner's permission of them measuring as evidence for qualifications. So they were cameras on smartphones and they were cameras, digital cameras in the center as well. But that was a way of learners being able to demonstrate that they actually could undertake the without having to use pen and paper. The next topic that was very popular among the tutors was algebra. Now, algebra is one of those topics that learners often talk about as, as, as being the, the root of, of anxiety when it comes to mathematics. Even the word itself and some of the language that comes up in the topic can be quite intimidating. And if you type into Google or any search engine, maths teacher or maths lecturer, you're bound to come up with images of somebody standing at the front of a room in front of a board, a blackboard or a whiteboard with lots and lots of letters and numbers, lots of pretend algebraic formulas on that board. And it's, it's associated with something that's uncomfortable and intimidating. So tutors themselves have, felt, have said that they felt intimidated with the idea of teaching algebra. They were worried about how their learners would take it. And quite often they left it till the end of a course or a qualification um, rather than tackling it at the beginning. I want to tell you about some of the some of the approaches that came from the original case studies and that were used by the members of the Action Learning Project. The first example I want to tell you about is the snooker example. This was developed by Mark Prendergast of Trinity College Dublin as a way of making algebra meaningful to people who are interested in the game snooker. And in this example, because each ball in the snoo game of snooker is allocated a certain number that doesn't change, you can actually write out the score of a game using variables and using the, the numbers themselves. Here's an example. In an exhibition game between Ken Doherty and Jimmy White, Ken potted nine reds, eight blacks, two blues, and one yellow. Now, a red ball in snooker is worth one point. A black ball is worth seven points. A blue ball is worth five points, and a yellow ball is worth two. So we can write out Ken's score, which we can call S for short, as being nine reds plus eight blacks plus two blues plus one yellow. Or we can exchange the color for the, the value of that ball. So we're saying that there were nine lots of one point, eight lots of seven points, two lots of five points, and one lot of two points. And if we add all of that together, we can see that the score is worth 77. Now, various of the tutors in the Action Learning Project took this away and used it with their learners with varying degrees of success. One tutor used it with a group of parents of secondary school children who had already looked at algebra and actually quite enjoyed it. And, and, and they found this quite simple um, at coming at the end of their course. And in fact, that tutor says that what she will do is she will use this example to introduce algebra to learners in groups in the future. She said she might also buy mini snooker tables with mini balls and ask the learners to have games of snooker um, and, and, and write out the scores um, using algebraic notation. Uh, another tutor used it with a group who, who very much enjoyed it and actually found that this helps algebra to click for them. While a, while a third tutor used it with a learner who actually wasn't that keen on snooker and, and wasn't sure of the scores of the balls and actually found it quite confusing. So she wouldn't use that with learners who weren't familiar with snooker in the future. Another tutor wanted to bring algebra to life a bit and help learners to relate it to, 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 to meaningful situations. And she used worded problems. She gave worded problems to her learners, such as the following. We'll look at the top one there. There are 12 tennis balls in a bag. There are X 
white tennis balls and five green tennis balls. She found that most of her learners were able to work out logically that there must be seven white tennis balls. But when it actually came to writing that as an equation, then they, they struggled a bit. So she found that spent giving learners time to work together and discuss these problems helped them to understand equations back to front. And she gave them problems like this to take away and work on and found that it was quite a useful, quite a useful process to go through. A, another tutor used a very interesting approach, um, which, which I would like to tell you about using her words. And this was an approach that she found very useful for teaching the concept of like and unlike terms in algebra. And she called this the pocket example. And she would fill her pockets of her trousers or her jacket or whatever she was wearing with a range of objects, including keys, coins, pens, that kind of thing. And then she would pull out an object one at once and talk to the learners as she did so. So I'll use, I'll, I'll read her words as, um, so that you can hear how she described the activity. I held up, for example, a pen and then another pen and asked, what do I have here? The answer was one pen and one pen. Can these be added together? I said, yes. Now we have two pens. Next, I held up maybe a coin and a key and asked, what do I have now? A coin and a key. Can these be added together in any way? The answer was no. The tutor has found this example works really well for introducing like and unlike terms as a concept. And the idea that like terms can be added together while unlike terms cannot. And she's found it very useful to refer back to the pocket example when needed in order to remind learners of like and unlike terms because it was a very visual and live example of that context. So that's the two um, topics. You will find a lot more in, in this report and indeed in the original report, the What Really Counts, which is this one, and the What Really Counts Next reports. If you go into those reports, you'll see that each of them has at the back a practice table, which separates out the various topics that the tutors looked at, and it describes what they did and what happened to an extent. So there are lots and lots in there about measurement and algebra, but also about other topics as well, such as ordering decimals um, and the use of digital technology. Uh, there are also case studies about using um, integrated approaches for teaching and working with English for speakers of other languages learners. Do have a look at these reports. As I said earlier, your adult literacy organizer or resource worker may well have hard copies, but they are both available to download as PDFs for free on NALA's website, which is here. Now, before I go, I want to turn to some questions which have come in from tutors who took part in the original project. When we told them that we would be recording this video, we said, what are the sorts of things that you think you and other tutors would want to know about these topics and generally about numeracy? So I'm going to start off with a question about algebra. And there was a question from Elaine in Killarney. And Elaine said, is there another term or word which can be used instead of algebra? My experience is that learners have a negative association with this word. Now, that's a very interesting question, which is mirrored in another question we had from Angela in Drogheda. And she said, should tutors spend time teaching the vocabulary around algebra? And I presume, Angela, by that you mean words like equation and formula, um, like and unlike terms. And I would say there's no getting away from the correct language that learners are going to have to know. Um, and, and have the right to know and use. 
but I think we need to think about how we introduce the topic of algebra. And we can introduce algebraic thinking early on without using these terms. We can talk, for example, about missing numbers. We can offer um, worded examples like, Patri like Patricia did in her real life examples. Get people thinking, well, you know, if you have 12 tennis balls and five of them are green, the rest are white, how many are white? You're getting people thinking about that if you then start to write these down so that people can see maybe not a question mark or a box, but you can bring in X or Y, then that should help people to start thinking. If you can then say to people, well, what they're doing is algebra, then that can help break down some of the stigma that they associate with that topic. I would certainly start to bring in steadily um, some of the terminology as Angela has asked, um, but I would say to, I mean, we're working with adult learners and, and, and we need to be encouraging all learners that we're working with to ask why and say when they don't understand something. And if they don't understand it, ask us again. It's our responsibility to explain it and help you to understand. When I was thinking about this question, it occurred to me that when I was at school, the word equation was a word on its own and I didn't associate it with equal which is part, which is a root of the word equation, meaning that something balances. Um, and I find that quite surprising that I never made that connection. If we can help our learners to make connections between, um, be, be, between words, then we can take away some of the mystique and some of the intimidation that's, that's associated there. There's another question here from Angela and Drockada again about algebra. Is it important to relate algebra to real life and do learners have difficulty with this? Well, I think because you're asking the question, Angela, that, 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 that probably you, you, you have recognized that, that learners often do have difficulties. But I would say that quite often tutors have difficulties as well in my experience. We feel that we ought to be able to relate concepts to the real and to the meaningful. And it is a bit of a challenge sometimes, especially with something like algebra, where we've been used to dealing with it in the abstract, almost as a series of puzzles um, involving letters and, and numbers. But I would definitely use Patricia's approach using those real life examples. What we're often doing with algebra is filling in the gaps. We're working backwards from information that we already have, which is a very useful skill in real life. The snooker example is meaningful to people who are interested in and understand snooker, but it's not necessarily a real life example in the true form because a lot of people won't be interested in snooker. Try and get real life examples from your learners. Here's a challenge. Think of Patricia's real life examples like the tennis balls. What if you asked your learners to work together to come up with their own real life examples and set them for each other as puzzles? That might be quite an interesting task to do. They could think in terms of shopping or they could think in terms of sport that they're interested in or, um, or any other hobbies and see what comes out of that. I think that could be quite interesting. And a final, a final question here from Claire in Cork who asks, um, is there a NALA online site where we can contribute our own ideas arising out of this project? And I think that's hopefully an indication that Claire's gone away and thought of new ideas that she would like to share with other tutors. One of the really good things that came out of this project was a sense that tutors can learn from each other through networking face-to-face -face or by sharing information over email, um, for example. At the moment, there, there isn't an actual dedicated site where you can do this. But Claire, if you have um, projects that you've done or resources that you've found and you would like to write a short piece about it, you can submit that to NALA and they will include that in the e-zine, which is a magazine that goes out by email every two weeks. If you want to write a slightly longer piece, then there's the Literacy Matters Journal, which NALA publishes twice a year. But as well, there's a Facebook page that NALA has. And if you click like on it on Facebook, you can go on there. If you want to ask for help with a particular topic, NALA say, please feel free to message the Facebook page and the person who's administering it will put that request on the Facebook page. And there are thousands of people who read that every day. 
again, if you come up with a resource or a website that you found particularly helpful, please share it. Go onto the Facebook page, send a message, and Nala will put that on their Facebook page to make sure that people hear about what's going on there. Thank you for those questions. And that's us at the end of this video. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope it's inspired you to go back and, and look at these reports again. I hope you do. Again, if you can't get hold of them, go onto Nala's website, www.nala.ie, and have a look. Before I sign off, I'd just like to pay tribute to the tutors themselves uh, and their managers for allowing them time to take part in the project. It was a really exciting project to be part of. There were some really interesting discussions that we had and and and, and the, the tutors who took part seemed really to enjoy it and, and certainly gave us very positive feedback.